Hello and welcome to Happier, a podcast where we talk about strategies and solutions for building happier, healthier, more creative, and more productive lives. This week we'll talk about Design Your Summer 2023 edition, and we'll interview Sarah LaFleur, the founder and CEO of the women's clothing brand MM LaFleur, to talk about clothing, the joy of clothing, and the five senses. I'm Gretchen Rubin, a writer who studies happiness, good habits, the five senses, human nature. I'm in New York City, and joining me today from Los Angeles is my sister Elizabeth Kraft. And Elizabeth, I'm so disappointed we're not together. We thought we would be together today for this recording, but it didn't work out. Yes, that's me, Elizabeth Kraft, a TV writer and producer living in L.A. And yes, Gretch, I ended up not being able to make my trip to New York, but I'm coming in a few weeks so we will be together then. Yes, at last. For more, and we will have lunch at a department, department store. store lunch and other sisterly adventures. Yes, I cannot wait. Yes. A few updates before we launch in. First of all, we are going to be doing the Happiness Podcast Book Club in episode 432. Big surprise, we're doing Life in Five Senses. <laughs> We've gotten a lot of good questions and comments, so keep them coming. We want to have a lot of listener questions. And Elizabeth, I'm very much looking forward to you interviewing me. I wonder what more I do we know. have to say, but we'll find more. Yes. Also, we are collecting examples of everyday luxuries. I don't know about you, Elizabeth, but I find this endlessly fascinating. And Absolutely. like you gave me a lotion warmer for Christmas, which seemed like the most indulgent thing, but I absolutely love it. It really is. It's something that I really do perceive as a luxury and really look forward to and, and, and feel like it's a massive indulgence. Someone said frothy milk. It's kind of like mm. having something monogrammed. It feels very elevated when you have frothy milk. And once people point out these things as luxuries, I think we experience them as more luxurious. So I'm gathering these up and we will talk about them in an upcoming episode. So send them in because we are uh, gathering them. Yeah, Gretch, also want to remind everyone that at the very end of the episodes, after the credits, we have a little button. Yes. Just a little extra something. So if you don't know about that, do um, listen to the end. Yeah, I found out with what a podcast that I was listening to. I'm like, I've been missing this the whole time. I didn't know they did this. I would have listened if I'd known. (laughs) But okay, this week, our Try This at Home suggestion is something that we've talked about for several years now in a row, because it's so helpful, which is the reminder to design your summer. Just saying that sounds fun, Gretch. Just the words, design your summer, makes me in a good mood. Yes, we've talked about this in episodes going all the way back to 27. I know we talked about it in 67, 118, 224, 276, and more. I mean, it was originally inspired by an observation by an author I love, Robertson Davies, in his essay, Three Worlds, Three Summers. He wrote, Every man makes his own summer. The season has no character of its own unless one is a farmer with a professional concern for the weather. Circumstances have not allowed me to make a good summer for myself this year. My summer has been overcast by my own heaviness of spirit. I have not had any adventures, and adventures are what make a summer. And it seems like the summer can just fly by so quickly if we don't think about, well, How can I make my summer feel like summer? For him, it was having adventures. It could be different things for different people, but you want to go into the season and think about what do we want from the season so that it doesn't just slip by. And of course, Gretch, there's no one way to design your summer. There's so many different approaches you can take. One thing that I think is super fun is you could have summer of the five senses. So you could take Mm -hmm. the neglected sense quiz, uh, GretchenRubin.com slash quiz, And plan something for your neglected sense. Maybe if your neglected sense is hearing, you'd go to a sound bath. Or if your neglected sense is touch, you could do cryotherapy, just something to have an adventure. Or you could do something with your appreciated sense. So like if you loved taste, maybe you go to five new diners. Or you could just do five new hikes or five new parks. Because one of the things that research shows is that doing new things tends to make us happier. So if you push yourself to try new adventures, that's probably going to make you happier. Yeah, Gretch, I can imagine someone would, you know, do massage or a flower arranging class or a cooking class, just depending on what sense they want to tap into. Right. Yeah. Because you want to do appreciated sense. You want to do neglected sense. You want to do something just because you heard of it and sound fun. One of my friends, speaking of the sense of sight, she had a summer of pink 
where she decided that she was only going to wear pink for the whole summer. And she did it, which I thought was really funny. I love that. I don't have enough clothes in any one color, except if I had like the summer of black, which I don't think sounds that, that, that sounds a little <laughs> hot. But listen, I have, I have a suggestion that occurred to me yesterday was when I was at the Met. You have to play a role. Can I can I give you an assignment right now? Okay. Okay. So you know I love the sense of color, and I wanted to bring the sense of color into my Design Your Summer. So I want you to pick a color for me right now, and then throughout the summer, I'm going to be searching for this color throughout the Met, like in paintings, in, okay. in ceramics. Where can I find this color? So what color would you propose? I'm going to propose, Gretch, that you look for bright Kelly grass green. Ooh. You know when grass is really, yes. really green, ultra green? Yeah. That's the color. Because I think that's like a very summer color. Yes. And also, I don't think it'll be that common. Fresh green grass. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, yes. I love that color. Okay. Well, I think what I want you to do is go online Find a swatch of it okay. because there are so many okay, beautiful I'll greens. Like, it is it the you. green of the dress that I wore when I was in Los Angeles? There's that green, but maybe maybe that's a little bit too olive. Maybe you're thinking about something that's a little brighter. Anyway, I want to get the right, the exact yes, color. Yes, I'm thinking of more toward Kelly green. Okay, but I will find a, I will find a picture because I did that with the Pantone color, and I had so much fun doing it, searching for a color. But it, it's hard, so I think this will be a good. It might not take the entire summer, but it's a good summer quest. Yes. Okay. And Gretch, with our Go Outside 23 and 23, you could have a summer of going outside, yeah. making a plan for spending more time outside. I think a lot of people want to do that in the summer. Yeah. No, it's just, it feels like the right time. But again, it can slip by. You can think, oh, of course I'll spend a lot of time hiking. But if you don't go out of your way to design it into your everyday life, oh, we'll go to the botanical garden over and over throughout the summer. And then you just never end up doing it. So it's like, figure it out. Yeah, I love the idea of like having a summer of picnics Ooh. where you're going to do one or two picnics every week and that would get you outside and also it just kind of shakes it up. I love it. I Wait, what is a more fun word than picnic? I love the idea of a uh, picnic. <laughs> Haven't been on a picnic in so long. Okay, but here's something I'm thinking about doing. So, you know, I go to the Met every day, but then sometimes I'm like, but it's so beautiful outside. I hate to like mm. give up that time to go indoors. You know when it's just so beautiful? I'm sure you have this in Los Angeles where it's so beautiful you don't want to go inside. I'm thinking that if it's really beautiful outside, maybe I can go to the Central Park or the Met. And then it'll probably ah. get so hot that I'll want to go into the Met and not be in the park. But because mm. a lot of times I can't both go to Central Park and go to the Met. Yes. So I'm thinking maybe I will open that up. So I won't be going to the Met every single day the way I have been, but... I will be going to Central Park. Well, I'm interested to see how this goes, Gretch, because with your upholder nature, it's hard for you to yes. change the rules. Well, so that's I'll be right. curious to hear if you um, go through with this. Yes, that is exactly my problem, which is I'm like, can I give up the perfection of going to the Met yes. every single day, even for something like enjoying the beautiful springtime? It's very painful for me to change the rules. Okay. Yeah, so tell me how that okay, goes. Okay, that's an upholder. Well, Gretch, for me, uh, I will be outside a lot this summer because for me, it's summer of the strike. Mm. You know, I'm on strike and I will be picketing a lot, which is, of course, all outside. Yeah. That is my summer of being outside, but I'm calling it summer of the strike. And I'm hoping that it will not be fall of the strike as well. I'm hoping it'll be over at some point this summer. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't think about the fact that it's always outside, obviously. So now you're way surpassing your go outside 23 and 23 because yes. you're doing it for hours. Well, I think my summer, and I was going to do this last summer and then I didn't, but I'm going to do summer of rereading. There are certain books that I am so excited to reread, demanding books what I don't like is the opportunity cost, because if I'm rereading this very demanding book, like Elias mm. Kennedy's Crowds and Power, then there's all these new books that I can't read. But I really, really want to reread certain books. So I'm going to have, I'm, I'm finally circling back to my summer of rereading. Oh, good. You will love that. Well, let us know if you do tread this at home and how you plan to design your summer. We can all learn from each other. It's fascinating to hear what people do. Let us know on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook. Drop us an email at podcast at GretchenRubin.com. And as always, you can go to the show notes for this episode. It's happiercast.com slash 431 for everything related to this episode. Coming up, we've got a hack that will help you tap into your taste sense. But first, this break. And now for a happiness hack. 
Yes, this comes from Maya. She says, I'm a food scientist and we use taste, smell, touch, and sight when developing and testing a product with consumers. The aim is to delight in all the senses, but sound is a bit more nuanced with product testing. In sensory testing, we often get trained on a new set of, quote, lexicons when you start working on a new category. Those are sets of words that can be used to describe attributes of a product. Soup has a whole different lexicon than bakery or beverage. Sometimes just learning the words can help you describe something better, leading to more productive conversation of a group. Try Googling sensory and lexicons for a flavor you're interested in, like cinnamon or vanilla. You'll be surprised at all the words you can use to describe it. Might prompt some more fun for taste. What an amazing idea, Gretchen. This is so fun. I mean, for both you and me, taste is our most neglected sense. And if people want to know their most neglected sense, go to GretchenRubin.com slash quiz. But this is really fun. I found lexicons for coffee, beer, chocolate, orange juice, tea. And it's funny, like when you see these words, you do start to taste more specifically. I saw that when I went to Flavor University, when I was writing Life in Five Senses, that when people offer you the vocabulary, you begin to be able to detect it much more easily. Yes. Yeah. And I think I always think of this with wine because people have all these words to describe wine, but I never thought about it with all these other tastes. Yeah. Right. You could look it up for ice cream because there's so many things. Yeah. But so here's something that I did. This is expensive. So I'm just saying to people, this is expensive, but maybe as a gift or if there's somebody in your life who really loves wine, whiskey, or coffee, a listener told me about this website, lene.com. And it's ne like French, N-E-Z. So it's L-E-N-E-Z.com. And you can buy these really nice kits They're like wooden boxes that are full of different smells and all the different components of like, I got made to coffee. And so it's all these coffee smells and it is so fun. I mean, I was like, I'm going to splurge on this because I am writing a book about uh, life in five senses. Yes. But like Eleanor will do it with her friends. They'll get out coffee and they'll get out the box and they'll smell it because it is really fun to do. So if there was somebody in your life who's super into whiskey, this could be something where it lets them enjoy that in a more nuanced, sophisticated way. But it's still that delightful quality that she's talking about because by having the lexicon, you actually become a more acute observer. It really helps. You can take it to the next level. Take it to the next level. So I'll put a link to lene.com in the show notes. It's really fun. And now for an interview with Sarah LaFleur. Sarah LaFleur is the founder and CEO of M.M. LaFleur, a women's clothing brand. And Sarah and I recently did an event together at the M.M. LaFleur store here in New York City. And she and I had so much fun talking about the five senses and clothing and stretchy fabrics and color that I thought, oh, Let's have her on the podcast. In 2011, Sarah set out to launch a line of clothing for working women that would be simple, elegant, and well-tailored. She had no experience in fashion, but partnered with a top-line designer, Miyako Nakamura, to create M.M. LaFleur, which is now a multi-million dollar company. And Gretchen, I listened to a fascinating episode of the How I Built This podcast with Sarah, um, where she talked about the company, and it really just sort of drew me in. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Gretchen. Hi, Liz. So great to be here. We're so happy to be talking to you. We are. Now, Sarah, you love to talk about the joy of dressing. What do you mean by that? And how do we keep it joyful? Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. This is such a great question, because I do think, for the most part, getting dressed, especially for work settings Mm -hmm. comes with a lot of angst. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a statistic that we share with a lot of customers, which is that the average American woman takes two more weeks per year getting ready in the morning versus men. Wow. Which is just kind of extraordinary, right? And you could say, well, maybe she's really having a great time with those two weeks. But I'm guessing that for a lot of women, that time is wrapped up in angst and worry about whether they're wearing the right outfit that day, whether their hair looks exactly the way they want it to. And so I think it, it, it it's caught up in a lot of responsibility, maybe that they're feeling towards themselves or, or towards others. And so I think M.M. LaFleur, my company, is really all about trying to take back 
both the joy and the time. And what we say to customers is we want getting dressed in the morning to really feel like that joyful process where you're saying, what do I want to feel like today? Oh, I want to feel like I'll just, you know, I'll be honest this morning, my kids, I have three, two and a half year olds. They all have pink eye. And so Uh they didn't go to school. I was super stressed. I had a really big week of, I I hosted a big event on Wednesday. So I was feeling wiped out when I heard my uh, toddler yelling for me at 5.45 a.m. And so I reached for this pink sweater that I'm wearing right now. It's a cotton boot clay sweater. It's super soft against my skin and it's comforting. And Mm. I, I just... As soon as I put it on, okay, maybe maybe my number one feeling today isn't joy. It's actually kind of exhaustion and how am I going to get through the day with these three kids who are not in school and all suffering from pink eye and making sure I don't get pink eye. But I'm wearing my sweater. It makes me feel cozier. It makes me feel better. And I really do think it's it's possible if you if you organize your closet intentionally, if you if you think intentionally about the things that you're 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 buying and you're putting on your body to really bring back joy and channel the feeling that you want to be feeling that day through your clothing. Well, one of the things that really surprised me, and I guess it wasn't that surprising, but it nevertheless did surprise me, which is that, you know, you can turn to your senses for comfort and that's the sense that people turn to. They turn to touch for comfort and whether that's like petting a dog or cat or like I'm a hair twister and my husband is a head patter and we clearly do that mm-hmm. to calm ourselves. And then some people like use fidget spinners or therapy dough and then like warm, cozy blankets and that kind of thing that are just comforting. And maybe that's part of why you'll have a special sweatshirt or Elizabeth, you and I are always talking about how we have these hoodies that are just right. And everybody around us is like, oh my gosh, please get rid of that hoodie. But you're like, but it feels so good. It's just the right amount of stretchiness and weight. And it is, it's the touch of it is comforting. So our clothes can give us that sense of comfort because it, it is tapping into that sense. A hundred percent. And Gretchen, you said this in your book yourself, you know, touch is the only sense that we have all over our body. Yeah. And Mm. I think it doesn't matter how old we get. We we are all searching for comfort, yes. I think especially in the world that we're living right now. Yeah. And it's just unfortunately no longer appropriate for us to walk around carrying around a teddy bear or a blanket. Yeah. And so well, clothes are, I really believe it's a, it's a close second. And um, we have one um, fabric group. It's, it's Italian Jersey. It's made by this incredible family operated mill called Bardazzi. And they make the softest Jersey and it, almost feels like pajamas. I mean, mm. I, it, is, it is basically mm. pajamas, but we release that as a suit. Actually, my doctor, who my, my, she's my IVF doctor, actually, Dr. Choi, she texted me Wednesday and she said, I'm off to California for a business trip. And I put on these pants for the first time. And oh my God, I've never <laughs> felt more comfortable with more <laughs> pants. And I was like, that is exactly how I want you to feel, how I want people to feel when they wear our clothes. Well, one of the things that surprised that. me when we were doing our event together the other night. So, you know, you took the neglected sense quiz and your most neglected sense was sight, which I thought, oh, you know, here you are at this clothing company. I thought that was surprising. But then in talking to you, you feel very much more focused on touch. And also you're, you're not designing the clothes. Were you surprised that that was your most neglected sense? You know, it surprised me only in that I thought it I thought it was probably my most important sense. Mm, mm. Professionally. Exactly. Professionally and probably as a mom, I think it's my probably, mo- or I, I think it's my most used sense. And so that did surprise me. And at the same time, it did remind me, it's my co-founder, Miyako Nakamura. You know, she is really the design talent behind our brand. She's the chief creative officer, you know, and is really an artist. And so... I think she sees clothing differently from I do. Mm. I'm much more focused on what we just talked about. I'm focused on how it feels because I'm I'm really turning to it for comfort. Mm -hmm. I'm focused on machine washability and wrinkle resistance. (laughs) And Miyako makes it look good. And so... So that didn't entirely, I think, in after after thinking about it, surprised me. That's fascinating. Well, Sarah, what I'm wondering is, is how have people's clothing choices changed post-COVID? It has changed. I think if you were a 
alien who kind of dropped into Wall Street in 2023 <laughs> versus 2019, mm -hmm. I think you could you would say, wow, women are dressing totally differently. Mm. I'm not sure about the men, but I think the women are dressing mm. totally differently. And I, we really even see this reflected in our sales, you know, dresses and, and I would say like work dresses for, for lack of yeah. a better term, mm -hmm. they, a lot of kind of pencil skirt type dresses, they used to be 30% of our business. And then during COVID, it probably dropped to 12% of our business and, and it's climbed back up, but it's nowhere close to where it was. And what has really replaced it is jackets and pants, you know, mm. and, and jackets, especially jacket sales have actually doubled from pre-COVID. And I think a lot of women, and I see this with myself, you know, I'm I'm kind of flexing from one situation to another. So I might, you know, I, I, I might do a meeting uh, from home in the morning and then I might drop my kids off at school and then I might run into the office. And so I'm kind of in multiple situations during the entire day. And the jacket allows me to flex really easily from saying, okay, I'm relaxed, I'm at home or I'm with my kids so I don't care if it gets dirty to, okay, let me put, throw my jacket mm. on. I'm talking to a business colleague. I want to look like I, I showed up and I'm, I'm ready to go. And, and so that jacket is kind of this like all powerful signifier, I think now. Um, and it's occupying this like new, new role in our wardrobe that I don't think it necessarily did before. So it's like instant outfit. It, it, totally. It's like your, it's your superwoman cape. You know, I throw it on and I'm like, I'm ready for business. Well, this is so funny because Elizabeth and her blazers. Yes. <laughs> I went through this period of just wanting blazers and then I bought all these blazers and I had a goal of wearing, you know, two blazers a week and then COVID hit. And I just completely had no use for these blazers, but now I'm starting to get them out again. And it's great. I, it's funny, Sarah, I noticed that you have a, a category called power casual. <laughs> I feel like that's how I should dress. I'm a TV writer. Power casual just feels right for me. What would you call that? Is that the blazer and the pants? For sure. I mean, I, you can certainly pull off a power casual look with dresses, but I think the most standard go-to, and this is certainly, this is my Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday uniform now, because that those are three days uh, where I'm usually in the office or meeting people. It is definitely the blazer with a little underpinning, which could be a knit piece or a, even like a, a nice t-shirt and then, and then pants and, and we really, I think, you know, I remember for New York, right? New York, which is where I live and which is where our company is based. And our return to outdoor life, I think, was later than a lot of other parts in the country. But really, last spring, we had a lot of customers just kind of running into our stores being like, I'm going back to the office. Yeah. I do not know how to wear. Yeah. I do not know how to dress anymore. <laughs> and then, you know, I'm speaking for myself. I put on weight. Like my old clothes no longer fit. Like I, I need kind of a, a new way to dress. Yeah. What does that look like? And so we said power casual. That's the way to do it. It's we call it one level, one step below business casual, uh, but one step above ooh, truly casual. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Business yeah. casual, casual, and then it's athleisure. Maybe it's athleisure. Exactly right. And I think a lot of women and we and again, like we see this in the numbers. Like athleisure, there was definitely a time and place for it, but I think a lot of our customers are saying like it's not. It is not actually what I'm going to be wearing right. Monday through Sunday. Right. So I love a good Lulu lemon align pant more than you know, just as much as the next next woman. But when you when you're seeing people and when you want to show up for these different moments in your life, you know, talking about again like joy and and how can you show up for these moments i do think clothing is a it's like a it's just a tool in your mm -hmm. in your toolkit i think a lot of mm -hmm. you know and you can you can do different things like some people want to give themselves a pep talk and some people want their hair to look a very certain way and and there are different ways you can get yourself ready for that moment to, to you know show up but for me my chosen kind of tool is, is clothing and I think you, we've all experienced this mo um, this moment, right? I mean, a Halloween is even a good example. Like, if you wear a costume, you suddenly almost feel like you could be a different yeah. person. It's incredibly powerful. Yeah. And my mom used to say to me, like, why does a doctor wear a white coat? Yeah. It's not because it's practical. It's because when that person with the white coat walks into the room, you know that's mm. the person you're going to be listening to, and you should be listening to. When I was clerking, so I clerked for uh, a judge on the Second Circuit and also for a Supreme Court justice, it was astonishing how they would seem transformed when they put on their robes. I mean, and I thought it was a really good thing. Like, you should feel transformed. You should feel like you have a special responsibility. It should feel different. When you put on your robe, you are playing this role that is transcendent. 
but it was it was really like seeing it happen to somebody you knew right in front of you. It was bonkers. I love that story. And I love that, right? That That's the Superwoman Kate moment. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And so I 100% agree. I just love that now we can have clothes transform us, but also be comfortable. <laughs> and that's the key. I think, you're, Liz, you're spot on. I don't think any of us want to go back to pants that kind of suck the air out of us. I mean, may- maybe some of us do, but I mean, I just think I think I don't, I certainly don't have the patience for it. And so pants are, I'm I'm sure you've noticed, like they're getting looser again, like skinny pants are, I don't want to say they're on their way out because I think actually what's happening is there's just more variety Mm -hmm. now and kind of a lot of things go every, you know, and it's not one or the other, but um, the elastic waistbands, like we have these pants called the Colby pants, the Colby, and, and they look like, they all, they look like, you know, kind of nice trousers, but they have an elastic waistband and they are, they are one of our best selling pants. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they were doing it. They were, they were great pants before the pandemic, but post pandemic, their sales have skyrocketed. And I think for good reason. Mm -hmm. And then heels, I just don't see a lot of women going back to heels. Like there, there's a moment for them and people still love wearing them, but it's not really kind of the, the everyday Mm -hmm. um, go to the way I think it was pre pandemic. It's funny, my husband Jamie and I have been watching Better Call Saul, and one of the characters is a, an associate in a law firm, and I just, like, I cannot take my eyes away from her heels because I'm like, you got to get out of those heels. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> and, and, like, every minute she could take them off, of course she's taking them off, so you realize how uncomfortable they are. It's hilarious. Okay, but Sarah, before we let you go, we need to ask you, what is your try this at home suggestion for listeners who want to try something to make themselves happier, healthier, more productive, or more creative? So I, I've actually, I've thought about this one, and I have to say my biggest life hack mm. recently oh. that my husband and I have stumbled upon is the date morning. Ah, ooh, so, a mm. twist on the on the traditional. Yes. I, yeah, I think... Um, You know, we've got three young kids. We can barely keep our eyes open past 930. And every, you know, we were like, God, we we really got to go to go on date night. Like we should, we should book, we should book something. We should go. And at some point I was like, why are we forcing ourselves to do something? (laughs) Actually, neither of us seems particularly excited to do. And so rather than getting a babysitter for a weekday night, which is what we used to do, we now ask someone to come on Saturday morning and we leave the house you know, around eight, we we go for a coffee and a pastry somewhere. And then we go and explore a new neighborhood in New York. And we live in Brooklyn now. So like every different neighborhood feels like you're almost visiting a different city. Mm-hmm. And so might true. just go to like a, a local restaurant for lunch and just explore and walk around a little bit. But two great things have happened. One is that we managed to stay awake for this. <laughs> and the second one is we're actually, we're seeing each other out in the daytime and, and it's, it just feels fresh. Cause it, you know, Monday through Friday, it's really, it's rare for us to see each other in broad daylight. <laughs> and so, just, you know, it's a new thing we're trying. We don't do it every weekend, but, um, We've really enjoyed it, and uh, it's we try to we try to schedule it when we can. That's great. Well, thank you so Love much, Sarah. Idea. It's been great to talk to you. Have a great date morning when uh, Saturday thank rolls you around. So much. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Gretchen. Sarah. Thanks, Liz. Coming up, Gretchen gives herself a New York City demerit, but first, this break. Okay, Gretchen, it's time for demerits and gold stars, and you're up this week with a happiness demerit. Okay, this is a 23 and 23 demerit. So you know how I had my monthly adventures? So I went on the ferry to Red Hook, and I went to Sunnyside in Queens, and then for April, I just 100% forgot about it. Did not think about it one time. Realized that it was May, and then all of a sudden, and I was thinking, oh, wait, you know, I'd kind of like to go to Greenwood Cemetery. And then I thought, oh my gosh, I forgot. I complete never once crossed my mind. This is why I need to keep looking at the list because mm, if I don't remind yeah. myself of it, I just forget that I've decided to do something. Or if I don't schedule it, put it like actually put it in the calendar, like here's a good place to do one of my adventures. So anyway, I just 100% forgot. And now, by the way, we're well, well, well into May, and I haven't done my adventure, yes. so I need to get that going. Uh, yes. Well, I give you a pass because your book came out, and I think you were very preoccupied, but 
You want to keep it up. I want to keep it up. And how about you, Elizabeth? What is your gold star? Grudge, I am giving a gold star to all of the other Hollywood unions who are supporting the WGA in our quest for a fair contract. Mm. We are getting so much support from IATSE, from the DGA, from SAG, from the Teamsters. People are coming out on the picket line with their own signs for their union saying, you know, SAG supports the WGA, they're in T-shirts. Trucks are turning around and not going into studios because they don't want to cross picket lines. So we're actually shutting down productions. I actually was uh, picketing the other day at Disney and I got teary. From seeing all the people who were not WGA, who were walking the picket line with us, it really just helps with morale to see how many people support us. It's not always the case that unions support each other that way. And it really is appreciated. I just want everybody to know that we appreciate it. We see it. And I hope that our fight helps their fight. Oh, that's wonderful. I want to buy my strike t-shirt. So later on, we're going to have to talk about which one is, which is the best t-shirt because I'm definitely want my t-shirt. The resources for this week, if you want Proverbs of the Professions from Teachers, because we're coming up at the end of the school year, and that gets us all thinking about how grateful we are to teachers and how much wisdom they have to impart. You can find that at GretchenRubin.com slash resources. And if you have any more, send them my way, because I love Proverbs of the Professions. What are we reading? Elizabeth, what are you reading? I am listening to The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. And I am reading The Glen Rock Book of the Dead by Marion Winnick. And that is it for this episode of Happier. Remember to try this at home. Design your summer. Let us know what you're doing to design your summer and how it's working for you. Thanks to Sarah LaFleur of MM LaFleur. And thank you to our executive producer, Chuck Reed, and everyone at Canes 13. Get in touch. Gretchen's on Instagram and TikTok at Gretchen Rubin. And I'm on Instagram at Liz Craft. Our email address is podcast at GretchenRubin.com. And if you like this show, you know what to do. I'm not even going to say it. (laughs) (laughs) Until next week, I'm Elizabeth Kraft. And I'm Gretchen Rubin. Thanks for joining us Onward and Upward. So Elizabeth, talking to Sarah made me think of one of the most kind of mysterious lines from Virginia Woolf's diary that I've always kind of been haunted by. She wrote, but I must remember to write about my clothes next time I have an impulse to write. My love of clothes interests me profoundly, only it is not love. And what it is, I must discover. It's like, oh, wow. What is it? Don't we all relate to that, though? I think so. From the Onward Project.